Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first ever episode of the Mormon Expositor Podcast. I'm your host, Brant Malone, and we have an amazing panel for you tonight. First, checking in from the Octagon is Amy. Amy, how are you? (laughs) I'm great. I'm really good. I'm ready to throw some hammer fists. I'm going to give some elbows from the top. We're going to turn this out. Good. (laughs) Um, Next, joining me, one of my uh, greatest adversaries is Greg. Greg, how are you? You know, I am uh, I am fantastic, and if I can be worthy to be called your adversary from now to eternity, it'll just be uh, it'll just be nothing but love through uh, through all time and ooh, Whoa, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, just, just moving on, <laughs> moving on. Uh, and and next is probably one of the uh, the sweetest people I ever met is uh, Heather. How are you, Heather? You think I'm one of the sweetest people you've ever met? Let me put it this way. Every time I've talked to you, I've never heard you ever angry, ever. So, yes. Oh, man. I know some people who would just not believe you said that. (laughs) Thank you for having me on your episode. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, this is the uh, the first ever episode of the Mormon Expositor podcast, and we feel that we should probably give you a little background as to how this idea started. Uh, ever since we found out that Mormon Expression was going to be retiring or going on a hiatus, uh, a conglomerate of us regular panelists and contributors to the Mormon Expression got together, and we felt that there was still so much more to be examined and discussed within the world of Mormonism. As a matter of fact, we felt that an exposition of Mormonism would be the best option. Uh, We're all very familiar with the Nauvoo Expositor and the concept of an exposition as far as exposing something hidden or exposing something to public view. However, I think there's another definition of exposition that we've all agreed on really fits our goal and vision for the podcast, and that is a setting forth or meaning of intent, a statement of rhetorical discourse intended to give information about or an explanation of difficult material. So that's kind of our goal. We're generously funded by the Whitefields Educational Foundation, and we really do have some great podcasts lined up. We decided that the best course of action for our podcast would really be to showcase the many different sides and views of Mormonism that we all have. So we've got a rotating panel of hosts that will all give many different perspectives. Uh, Those hosts include myself, uh, Amy, Greg, Matt, Heather, Clay, Troy, and we really wouldn't have any of this without the guru of web design and the lord of the internet, Richard Harris. Um, I I really don't want to spend the entire episode talking about how amazing our podcast is going to be, but do you guys have any thoughts about the the vision for the podcast in the future or, or how we came up with this? All I can throw out there is that our name comes from an inside Mormon joke, basically. It's not meant as a threat and that we have no intention of putting together exposés to make the church look bad. It's just a clever title given the history of the church. And we're certainly not going to scatter anybody's type. No. No, I would hope not. (laughs) As a matter of fact, it, no, it's interesting that, that he, you bring that up, Heather, because when we were originally talking about what kind of name should we have, we threw around this idea of the Mormon Expositor, and we did some Google searches. And if you ever want some some light Sunday afternoon reading, go ahead and look up the Mormon Expositor. It used to be a periodical back in Salt Lake City, and it was kind of a, kind of a tabloid-type periodical. And just go through, spend 20 minutes, and read some of the things that they talk about on there, because it's... It's either high comedy or uh, extremely cringeworthy, but it's 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 really interesting stuff. I think I'm pretty sure anyway that l- just like the Nauvoo Expositor, the Mormon Expositor only had one issue. At least that's all I found. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently in the process, if I get off my lazy butt, of making a PDF of it as well as typing up what it says in a Word document attached to that PDF so it's easier to read and then making that available for download from our Mormon Expositor website. That would be awesome. Anyways, that's that's really all I have to say about the introduction of the podcast, but here's what we want to do. We want to have a little bit of fun. We want to be able to still keep the high standard that we have as far as research and everything like that goes, but... 
I think for me personally, even as an active believer, one of the best parts about Mormonism is some of the funny cultural things that we have. And so we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking with everyone about Mormon fringe beliefs. And the amazing thing is these fringe beliefs usually have a little piece of doctrine attached to them or have a genesis somewhere, but they've either been taken to another level or they've been stretched out beyond belief. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that tonight. Let me ask you guys on the panel this. When is something a doctrine and when is it a folk doctrine or a folk belief or a fringe belief? Uh, Greg and I were just talking about this today. What, did you, what do you have to say about that, Greg? You know, I, th I think that this is actually, this almost becomes the crux or, or how, we, how we have to frame this. Because a lot of times in sort of our online world where we all chat about all this stuff, you know, one of the rhetorical positions of sort of uh, maybe the liberal, the liberal believing crowd is uh, like all religions believe crazy things, which – is mostly true. Um, mostly? It, well, I mean, the Unitarians don't believe a lot that's all that crazy. You know, mm. it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty not belief-centered. But one of the things that we look at with Mormonism is Mormonism then is essentially all revealed. Like it takes sort of 19th century Protestant Christianity and then just says, and what else can we come up with? So there's no source material in Mormonism. There's no, there's no archaeology. There's nothing – that roots this to anything um, old except pseudepigrapha. And so really everything – it's like um, as people were coming up with stuff and, and to some degree maybe still, it's like anything can go. Anything can go as long as you think that the spirit told you that. You can say, you know, this, this Lamanite – this skeleton was a white Lamanite named self. So um, – so it, it makes for an interesting mishmash of, of things that people really believe because this is kind of the basis of Mormonism. And yet you look at them and you go, wow. You know, and a lot of times we say things like, well, if you put it that way, but I, which is really you know, a nice way of saying, yes, it does <laughs> sound crazy, and, but I like it or I'm used to it. You know, I mean, my kids think the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny – and Santa Claus are uh, are all fine things as well. So it's just – I think it's really interesting and, and interesting to sort of look at that. So I don't know that I think there is anything besides a, doc, a folk doctrine versus a doctrine. The theology all comes from sort of the folkiness of it, and then some of it gets watered down and sort of – its magic glow gets removed, and then maybe we call that doctrine. Maybe the doctrines are more serious theology. I don't know. I think it's like – uh, cultism it's a spectrum so there is no defining line between what is a folk doctrine and what is actual church doctrine it's all on a spectrum and there and it, it just depends on i don't know how many people believe it or how how often it gets talked about in general conference that's exactly what i was going to say heather i think that it has everything to do with the cultural the cultural meaning it has the time it was given how it's taught by who is who teaches it? Is it taught in seminary, or is it just taught and you know your mom passes it on, or is it just something that's talked about, um, you know, kind of occasionally and like, well, I don't really know too much about it. I don't know if we emphasize it, um, and then who de-emphasizes it? Because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about on this list were highly emphasized at one point, and then. As the church grows and changes, even as short of a span of 50 years, something that was very hard-lined, you do not cross this line in the sand, is now something that's simply a guideline, we wish that you would do something, rather than if you do this, you are in apostasy. So I think it really depends on how seriously the leaders of our modern church take the teaching. It may have been a major important deal to Joseph F. Smith, but if Thomas S. Monson just doesn't really see how that relates to modern church members today, then all of a sudden it's really not that important. Well, and, and from the believer's perspective, I, I see two different things happening. And I think part of it's probably because I live in an area like Michigan that doesn't have a lot of believers. And I'm married to someone who grew up in, in basically you know the heart of Utah. But I see two different things happening. Number one... 
you know, Greg, you talked about how a lot of these these folk doctrines or fringe beliefs really don't seem to be rooted in in anything, right? Well, they're not rooted in source material that would be recognized by anybody outside of Mormonism. Yeah, yep. And and so what I see is is two separate things. Number one um, is I see people who are converts out here that kind of get the uh, you know they they get the nice easy missionary discussions, which. I'll be honest, they're, they can be a little bland to your normal member. Um, it's being nice. Um, but what happens is they, they cling on to these fringe beliefs, and they sit there and they say, that's that's something supernatural, or that's that's just outside of, of the realm of my own religious perspective, and, and I want to examine more about that. Or you have something else that happens, and I experienced this when I was living in Idaho when I was going to college, and even on my wife's side of the family, is you have people from these highly concentrated Mormon areas that pass along these stories that become, in a sense, folk doctrine, where it's it's something you won't be able to find in, like Greg said, any source material, but it's something that people just kind of take as belief, whether it be through passed on through other people's experiences, passed on through through random sayings in, in bygone eras that we just don't believe anymore. So... That's kind of where we want to go with this. Is there any more thoughts before we start kind of getting into our list? I, I had a thought that sort of crystallized as, as we're talking about this, and that is um, two things. One, the way that the way that these sort of what we are calling fringy doctrines, what they really are, I think, is the natural extension of people trying to dig into um, the surface doctrine. So you say, if this – than this. Well, give, um, give me an example that's that's not on our list. Well, okay, so one that we had at least talked about: the return of the ten tribes out of the north from a hole in the earth. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have you, you have this idea um, that perhaps the earth is hollow, and perhaps people, the ten tribes, disappeared there, and they're living in some hole in the earth because they're going to come out of the north on the highway that rises up or whatever. So we have this highly literalistic interpretation of scripture and Mormonism, Mormons are, are, are really, really intent on being literalistic about their interpretation of scripture, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this literalistic interpretation of scripture and say, well, then it must be so because Mormonism is also, um, cosmologically literalistic. Like, you know, it's not an attempt to metaphorically describe, life it's not it's not mormonism isn't really about the metaphysics mormonism is about trying to describe reality in 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 what i would posit as a scientific framework like this is the way reality is and so you you have to and you have to adhere to say whatever the scriptures are whatever the prophets have said you know you have to adhere to the idea that uh, well we don't really now that there were quakers you know men dressed up as quakers that lived on the moon and that we would never go there. You know, it's easier to just, I guess, toss that aside and just pretend it didn't happen. But these doctrines, these things are the attempt to explain and to make sense of, to fill in the gaps of the world, to fill in what it means for this, for whatever X is, to be reality. Um, I'm, I'm a bit nervous here, Greg, because I'm actually agreeing with you. Well, and I that mean, that scares not, the crap out of me. Well, you know. So <laughs> well, I, I want to say one other thing. In 2012, what the problem is, is that we are getting further and further, just as a world, not even really as a society, but as a world, we're moving further and further away from magical worldviews, and so we, you just clash against. The, the magical thinking that inhabits the beginning of Mormonism and really up through, I mean, really up through our lives and probably in, in large part now, but as it comes online and as it comes into conflict with a, a more rational world, it, it, it gets real uncomfortable. And people have to think, you know, people, people start to say, well, that's folk doc. We're not, we're not really going to have our own planet. No, that's totally what we believe. You know, I mean, mm. And the, you guys talked about that in the in the Book of Mormon doctrines missing episode. We totally believe that. That is, and, and in fact, that's a great example. That is an extension of the idea of um, becoming exalted. Is that, of course, well, 
by natural extension, you would have your own planets to to populate and to make three horned de- reindeer or whatever you want. You know, I mean, you know, where you get into this idea of well, on my unicorn, planet, I'm do this. bring yeah. back unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> my garments are going to be uh, thong underwear. Oh, you know, gosh. I mean. That's, uh, I know people who very seriously believe in the church and very seriously believe they're like, well, on my planet, we're going to have thong underwear for garments because I don't like these. Oh my so, uh, and I'm down with that. I have no problem with that. Amy. Anyway, I just think it gets more uncomfortable. I think it gets more uncomfortable to, to try and posit this stuff. And so it's just as easier to – you can't get rid of it. It's totally there. It's just me, easier to not talk about it. Amy, Let hit me. Just add something that to kind of, I don't know, necessarily to lighten it up or to even simplify something. What Greg is saying, not that I think it could ever be simplified, Greg, but <laughs> um, I think that a lot of what we're going to talk about today and a lot of what we experienced growing up is what I called sacrament meeting doctrine. Stuff that someone talks about in testimony meeting or someone mentions in Relief Society or a seminary teacher talks about a personal experience and then it kind of gets taken and it gets morphed. And as we're, Greg, as you were talking, um, the perfect example came to mind and it's not on our list, but um, is now part of the Mormon experience or at least part of the Mormon conversation. And that is Elder Larry Lawrence's talk last year on allowing your kids to have sleepovers Mm, and whether or not that was a good idea. Now, some of you in this group know that I was raised in an area where I actually went to school with Elder Lawrence's kids and his wife was my seminary teacher for two years. Now, he was what we called a power Mormon before he was called into uh, his position in the church. And I think, what is he in Russia or something now? Um, he was, you know, well respected, well known. They were very wealthy. Um, he had a whole brood of gorgeous children. And any time Elder Lawrence spoke, or even when his kids spoke in sacrament meeting, everyone really paid attention. And I remember in high school when I was going to school with his son, that was something that they he talked about in testimony meeting and that his wife talked about in seminary, that this was something that they themselves practiced and they had, you know, their own spiritual reasons. And she would talk about certain doctrinal influences and morality and so on and so forth. And here we are 20 years later, he's giving a talk in general conference about why Mormon families should not allow their kids to have sleepovers. Now, is it doctrine? Some people would say because it was spoken in sac- or in a general conference, it's doctrine. Other people would say it's an opinion. And who knows, in 10 or 20 years from now, this could be just a folk doctrine that, oh, I heard Mormons aren't allowed to have sleepovers. Well, oh, well, it does have some, you know, historical context because so-and-so used to talk about it. But I'm telling you, watching that turn into a declaration from the pulpit in general conference was really funny for me because it's nothing simply than a thought, an opinion, an idea, something that one person, one family took it on as their kind of like their family motto. Their kids weren't allowed to have sleepovers. And now lo and behold, it's in, you know, the ensign talks for everyone to read and ponder and decide if they're going to incorporate that into their own family belief system right and a whole generation is deprived of normal friendship exactly just like like the one pair of earrings for girls it'll show up in some it'll become part of the like the cultural um collection of what it means to be an upstanding mormon you don't you only have one pair of earrings and you don't go to sleepovers but the difference that we're talking about here is that these aren't things that make us appear culty and weird and insular. Uh, some of them. Some of them. Well, no, I'm mean saying these things, the things you're talking about, not having sleepovers and not having earrings. Oh, yeah, we're headed for a little house on the Prairieville there. But what what we're talking about tonight is more of the magical stuff. Oh, I you know. It's that. more of the, it's, it's more of the, 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 um, it's magical, mystical. It's it's uh, it's an LSD trip. So I get except that it's an LDS trip, I guess. So. <laughs> oh, clever! You're so funny. But um, um, <sighs> um, Grant, bring it. Let's go. Let's do it. All right. So I'll, I'll start out. Um, 
this one, my fringe topic that I chose first was the Holy Ghost goes to bed at midnight. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was younger, the saying that I always heard from my youth leaders was the Holy Ghost goes to bed at midnight, but you know who wakes up? The angel hormone eye. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have never heard that. Oh, yeah. We That's heard that fantastic. all the time. Um, this one's an interesting one because it, it focuses, number one, it focuses a lot on the youth and this whole concept that if you're out past midnight, that bad things are going to happen to you. But it also focuses a lot on, on the concept of chastity and the, the effect that it has on the youth. And I heard this all the time growing up. For me personally, I had an, an unwritten, unspoken agreement with my parents that if I was going to be out past midnight, that I would either give them a call. No, I, I would give them a call. I mean, I would either be home or I would give them a call. I actually know a lot of people who weren't LDS who followed this same concept. The interesting thing, like we talk about, is you take this one little concept it's personally, I think you take Mormonism out of the equation. All right. A group of teenagers hanging out past midnight without a certain action or plan happening is kind of the recipe for a bad idea. Am I, am I off in my thinking there? Actually, I think I'd agree with you. If you have a group of kids that are over at someone's house watching a movie past midnight, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, going to see a movie that's a little bit later at night. I don't have a problem with that. Um, a group of kids who go out to eat after a movie and it's past midnight, I don't have a problem with that. But I knew kids in my high school that would do this. They would drive around and try and find something to do 12, 30, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. And usually they were the ones that were not at school on Monday because they got busted for, for being minors and having alcohol in the car or getting caught with drugs and stuff like that. So I think with this concept, you take this normal thought process and you, you take it down these extreme roads, which is basically you hear stories about if you're not home by midnight, bad things are going to happen. And then it gets published in the Enzyme. And I'm, or not in the Enzyme. But Wait, in, has it been published in the Enzyme or this in is, the New Era? This is from the New Era, August 2005. Charles wow. W. Dahlquist II from a youth devotional given on May 12th, 2004 at the Salt Lake Tabernacle. He said, when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, my friend and I wanted to go to the senior all-night party. It seemed like everyone else was going, so we asked his father, who was our stake president, if we could go. He said, absolutely not. The Holy Ghost goes to bed at midnight. Now, he knows the Holy Ghost doesn't go to bed at midnight, but he also knows what tends to happen after midnight. Then he said something I will never forget. Find something positive to do that you'll be able to think of in years to come. The problem is, when you have declarations like that in an official church publication, you're going to have people, like like Amy said, that are going to take that and are going to take it and say, see... This is doctrine and this is gospel. I went to my, I, I'm, I'm a pretty faithful, active person. I went to my senior all night party. I knew just about everyone I went to church with went to their senior all night party. But again, it's like the sleepover thing. All of a sudden it's, it, well, do good Mormons go to senior all night parties? Do good Mormons go on sleepovers? And keeping up that appearance is very important in Mormon culture. I think we can all agree upon that. It doesn't matter if you are doing something completely innocuous, the fact that you were out past midnight, that in itself implies that you were doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start taking it to extremes. If we would do activities and stuff like that when I was in high school, and then at 10 o'clock we would go to someone's house and turn on a movie at 10 o'clock at night, but we were at someone's house, so it was kind of a quote-unquote safe environment and stuff like that. If if I'm being a good Mormon boy, but I'm out until 1230 at night at my friend's house, does that all of a sudden mean I'm a bad kid? Which is kind of the problem you get with, with some of these folk doctrines. So, I don't know. As someone who works with the youth and, and um, you know I, I bleed for those kids, this is one of those things that it frustrates me every time I hear a parent bring this concept up. Well, I... So one of the problems that I have with it is that it implies a flippancy with our theology that is that does not prepare you in any way to be serious about uh, to be serious about beliefs later on. Because okay, so if you if you go down the road of this and you say, well, really, the Holy Ghost goes to bed at midnight? Like God goes to bed at midnight in what time zone? I mean, like none of it. None of it makes any sense, and it doesn't make any sense on the surface, but it also says we're willing to say stupid things in support of our agenda. We never, I, and I think, we never thought it I was serious, that that, though. We never thought it was serious. We, always, we never thought, like, literally the Holy Ghost would go to sleep. We always thought this is, this is the way that it was described to us, that the, the, um, the effect of the Holy Ghost in, in 
uh, strengthening you against the temptations that are out there is less powerful after midnight than it is before midnight. That is the dumbest concept <laughs> ever. I mean, oh, okay, so do we actually think that God at, like loves his children and wants to protect them? So uh, this is one of those places where you look at the Mormon concept of God and go, wow, you are the worst parent ever. <laughs> <laughs> at the times when you're... At the times when your children actually maybe need need you to step in and be helpful, you're like, no, nope, I'm gonna let you die. You know, I'm, I'm. It's just, it's so disregarding of anything that would be called like maturity. I, it, to seriously posit that the Lord gives less influence just because the clock has ticked forward a, min, a minute, because uh, this actually, this doctrine is kind of an interesting one for me. The one and only spiritual experience that I cannot deconstruct is meeting my wife. And I, and and we won't get into that here. It's been said other places. But I met her after midnight. <laughs> and um and I I cannot um without just going to circumstance and and I don't and I am motivated to not go to circumstance and we'll probably talk about some of those motivations later on and sort of how that plays into these things. I cannot come up with a rationale for, uh, except to say that God brought us together, and He uh, and He very clearly did it after midnight, and uh, and so I always just kind of thought, eh, He doesn't go to bed at twelve, <laughs> um, and I'm I'm probably good with that. I I just want to thumb my nose at people who are that stupid. So fair fair enough, I, I guess. Harsh. Yeah, it is harsh. Um, it's hard being an apostate, Heather. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of. <laughs> Takes a lot of energy and vitriol. Listen, one day I'm going to bring you all back. Oh no, that's true. Yeah. Yep, you're going to do true. all our work for us. Damn you know, this is the perfect example of using religion and as the excuse to get your kid to do something. It's like saying if you're not good, hmm. Santa Claus isn't going to bring you any presents. Yeah. Like, why not just have a frickin' conversation with your kid and talk to him like a human being and be a realist and be reasonable and rational and discuss things and, and, and see how they feel about it? I mean... Well, I can answer that because you're dealing with teenagers who aren't reasonable, who aren't rational, and frankly, who... And I'm just imagining the way I was as a teenager. Teenagers are going to do what they want to do, and they're going to find any way to kind of weasel around and do that. That's the whole point of being a teenager is understanding the concept of boundaries and rules and things like that. Yeah, Brad, and they're going to roll their you. eyes when you... I agree with you to the, to the point of, you know, an underdeveloped frontal lobe and all that kind of stuff. However, I really disagree with dumbing down our parenting and making up stupid things like that because we don't think our kids know how to be will know how to behave in a certain situation because you set them up to fail when you give them these kind of things. Well I, I, I do agree with you there. If you have to start throwing around these ultimatums like like this, then and and I'll put a caveat in there. If you're throwing around ultimatums like this seriously, within my family, this whole thing was always a big joke. But I knew oh, in my family it was it was serious. Yeah, I knew the, people it who took it deal. seriously. All right, we've beat this one to death. Heather, you have any thoughts? I was just going to say I think it's an example of uh, the greater um, culture of controlling one another's behavior within the church. It remind it, it reminds me of when I was deciding whether or not I wanted to go to a church school for graduate school. And I asked a friend to find out who was attending BYU Idaho to find out for me if BYU required the same standards of graduate students. And when I chafed at what she told me, she she said things like, "Well, you wouldn't have a problem sharing your bedroom if you weren't going to do something inappropriate in it." So it's just it's one of those, you know. Wh why do you want to be out past midnight? There's no reason to be out past midnight unless you want to do something torrid. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. No, I I agree with you. All right. What about uh, what about your uh, topic, Heather? Okay. This um this is one that actually um is why I came up with wanting to talk about this. And it could be that my mother is the only person on the face of the planet. Oh no, and Chris Heimerdinger, who actually believe this, um, and that is that there were sleepers in the war in heaven meaning that there were people who actually agreed with Satan in what he had to say about what would happen here on the planet, but they were smart and they knew that they needed to get a body so that 
the devil wouldn't have control over them. So they pretended to go along with the people who were on Jesus' side so they could come down here and have a body. Now that, that is, is her freaking ex- awesome. That is her explanation for people like Hitler. No, okay, so the sleeper. Hold, hold on, let me back up. So it's not so much because I've heard a lot about the the less valiant. It's not so much that they were less valiant, but they actually they knew what they were doing, and like they knew they were, I guess, a, a quote unquote bad person. They knew they wanted to follow Satan and be bad, so they actually went along with everything to get a body, but didn't really believe anything. I wish I could quote my mother on what she said about this. It was something like, I am I know what's going on here. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and get a body and I'm going to go down to heaven and I'm going to wreak havoc or go down to earth and I'm going to wreak havoc. Did the Lord not have the powers of discernment? I don't know. Maybe it was maybe we all had to make our choices rather than rather than God telling us which group we were in. It, it could have been the whole agency thing. Yeah. I just That's when my awesome. mother it's just awesome mother, on so many levels. When my mother rolled it out, I was sitting there thinking, why hasn't this been turned it like why hasn't somebody else come up with this idea and turned it into some sort of doctrine? Send someone an email, Heather. This could be next year's <laughs> conference topic. You said that Chris Heimerdinger believed this. Well, he it's I I told it to a, a TBM friend of mine and she said, "Oh yeah." And I didn't use the term sleepers. I said that I basically explained the situation to her and she said, "Oh yeah, sleepers. That's in that's in Chris Chris Heimerdinger's book. I don't know the the ten, ten issues in the Nephites or whatever." You said it was awesome, Greg. So why do you think it was awesome? Well, I think it's a great example of that blank slate of of like um, just whatever batshit crazy thing comes into your head that you ascribe to the spirit can be your Mormon doctrine because Mormon doctrine is a blank slate in a lot of ways. And that's how we get the Journal of Discourses. So, I mean, you know, it's fascinating because people come up with this kind of crap and they really believe it. I mean, they really think, well, that just makes sense. It is well, an, it it's, a, a it's an extension of sort of this other idea of like, well, how did we get somebody like Hitler? He clearly has to have been a son of perdition. Oh, he kept his mouth shut. He was he was sly and just slipped on by while God wasn't looking and came down here. <laughs> That's just amazing. Yep. Let me uh, let me throw this out there. I, I think I mean I I agree with you to a certain extent, Greg. That's the closest you're going to get out of me. That. Some of this stuff is like I, I hear this and I sit there and even in my believer state, I sit there and I go, this is I, that doesn't make sense to me. But then I, I sit when I sit there and think about it, I can totally see someone. I wouldn't say um, just flat out lying, but Mormonism has this amazing ability to extrapolate and do these parallels with things. But the most amazing thing to me is, especially with some of these early uh, with, with some of the early doctrines and some of the fringe doctrines out there, they assign so much specificity to it. You know, this 100% explains how Hitler's here. And if you think about it from a Mormon background, you sit there and go, well, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. But then if, if I take myself out of it, I sit there and go, that is the craziest thing I've ever thought of. Like, for instance, if a Jehovah's Witness told you that, you'd go, dude, those people are batshit crazy. But someone mentions it to you in sacrament meeting or seminary, and you're like, oh, my gosh. If, if 80-year-old Sister Smith mentions it to you in sacrament meeting, you sit there and go, huh. Wow, that's a gold nugget right there. You're, just, you're, you're glad you made it to church that day to get that information. Absolutely. It's one of the deeper doctrines. Yes. I love it. And, and I'll be honest, before we, before we move on, that was my time in Idaho when I was going to college and, and my wife and I were going to the family ward, we were in this really poor area in Rexburg where you had assisted living. You had a lot of older people, like I'm talking like 70s and 80 year olds, and you had a lot of young, poor newlyweds. And I heard so much of this stuff. And if I would have heard it from my student ward, I would have just been so infuriated. But hearing it from sweet old Sister Smith, who can't hear a word she's saying, and you have to use a <laughs> microphone to talk to her, it just, like, it warms my heart because she so desperately believes this. And you kind of don't want to sit there and go, yeah, you're crazy, lady. You just kind of go, oh, that's that's really nice. It's because it's such an ancient teaching, Brant, yeah, from Sister Smith. That's probably it. It has to be true. Greg, what about your topic? So... I think I'm going with uh, garments and physical protection, mm. and I think, and this is a pretty enjoyable one. Um, 
I don't know the total specifics of it because I'm not sure which family member it was, but there's a there's a story that has run around my family when I was uh you know from when I was a little kid about a relative who had uh, who got doused in kerosene essentially or something flammable or was in a, a gas explosion and got all burned and everything but didn't get burned where his garments were. So we have this idea that garments provide physical protection against harm. And, uh, and I think a lot of the examples are burning examples. The, the doctrine obviously comes um, from this garment will be a shield and protection to you against the power of the destroyer and as much as you remain faithful, which I won't say where that comes from. It, um, so we, we, are, we have this talisman. So garments are the ultimate Mormon talisman, right? They are, the, they are this magical earthly thing that we imbue with all kinds of uh, – all kinds of reverence and protective magical power. And, and now the rhetoric is, you know, I think it's officially ramped up to, oh, you can't put those on the floor. The freaking underwear. Where, where, like, when you're taking them off so you can have sex, where are you supposed to put them? I don't, I don't understand this thinking. This is part of the reason why I can't be in the church. But this, I, I just think it's fascinating to think about that. Brant, you have something you want to say about the garments, right? <sighs> <laughs> um, this First, do you want me to go into my deep? No, King no, I'll. You can talk about it. I'll cut you off right here. Um, <laughs> this is this is one that I, I would say probably twenty years ago, up until about twenty years ago, made the rounds within the Mormon circles as one of those things where it was kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, anytime anyone was in a car accident, or for example, a, a burn victim, um, if they had been endowed, it was always well, but. But brother so and so was wearing his garments, and so it was nothing was burned there. Um, They're but, burn proof polyester, of course. But, yeah. Anyway, but uh, but I've seen over the last twenty years a, a very concerted effort to focus more on the spiritual aspects of the garment, and not so much the physical protection aspects. As a matter of fact, if you if you talk with with a lot of people, for example, my parents are, are temple workers. If you talk with them, they are actually counseled. You know. Don't talk about not so much. Don't talk about, but but don't feed into this myth that they are a physical protection. Heather, that's all you want to say, Brant? That's all I want to say about that. Well, so I, can I uh, go ahead, Heather? No, I was just actually going to say I don't have anything to say about this because I am not a temple knowledgeable person. So go for it, Greg. Well, so there's an interesting thing. I was I was actually just as we were researching this and looking a little bit at, at say Michael Shermer and he wrote why people believe weird things, <laughs> which goes right along with what we're talking about here. One of the things that we look for is is we look for the hits, but we don't look for the misses, right? We look for the where the where the narrative plays out, but we don't catalog all the places where the narrative doesn't play out. So when the dude burns to death and he's wearing his garments, um, we don't go like, but wait, I don't get it. He was wearing his garments; these should have been should have been protected. We just let that we just let that slide. And when, say, if you got into a car accident and you just miraculously didn't happen to have any injuries like where your garments cover and all of your injuries were on your like limbs and externalities or whatever, then we think, oh, look, see, this is pretty cool. So this is a real problem with our brain. We, we look for patterns. We look for confirming patterns like that. And it messes us up in all kinds of things. This is not a Mormon-centric um problem in any way we just don't recognize all of the evidence we only recognize the confirming evidence it's just kind of the way our brain works let me let me play devil's advocate for uh, for the active believers is that a bad thing is that a bad thing if if we um if we find the correlations there when they're there but we kind of ignore it when they're not there is that a bad thing yes well yeah, it, i would argue strongly yes yeah, it 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 remove it if especially if you think if you think that that's an acceptable way to process the world, it removes your ability to determine whether or not something actually is true. It also removes your ability to make responsible decisions about how to do things and will. Let's talk about tithing now. We can you do know, that. Or, yeah, cuz this one this one actually directly correlates. Um so the next one kind of going along with this concept is tithing. If you pay your tithing, money will magically appear to pay your bills. Um and this one is a bit of a sensitive one for me because I've actually seen it in my own life and I've seen it in my parents' life. One of my dad's um, defining moments for him as a as a new church member, as a newlywed, um, they had an option to basically put food on the table or pay their tithing. And 
I understand how this is going to sound to those who are disaffected from the church, but to them it was important to pay their tithing. And they paid their tithing and magically, in some words, or by the gift of God or by the grace of God, in other words, they had an opportunity to earn a little bit of extra money or they had um, – my, my dad uh, was, was working on something that was project-based and one of his suggestions actually went through and they were able to earn money then. So the, the difficulty with this one is this. Um, for me as a believer, I really do think and, – and you guys can, can mock me all you want – but as a believer, I've actually seen this happen in my life. And that's why I was asking that question because on one side, I've seen it happen positively for me where I've been in a position where, depending on the corollary you want to make, I paid my tithing and something positive happened out of that. I was able to pay my tuition. I was able to pay my rent or something like that. I was able to put gas in my car to get me to work. On the other side, though, I've been in positions where we pay tithing and all of a sudden I've got $5 to last me two weeks. So that's why I was sitting there trying to say, you know, it, as a believer, but someone who, who, frankly, gets the snot kicked out of them by Greg for, for thinking this way, I'm, I'm kind of torn because I see it happen both ways. The, the, second, way, the second way was I pay tithing and nothing has happened. And, the men- other, and, you're, and you're flat broke. Yeah. I mean, I've been in a position where, where I, I paid tithing and uh, I then paid my rent and I just had, you know, I, I was living off of ramen for, for about a week when I was in college. And the thought process that I had at the time was, why? Why isn't? Why aren't I finding forty dollars in my in my jeans pocket so I can go eat something other than ramen? Um, but then in the back of my mind, I had two thoughts going on. Number one was, well, you'll be paid in the future, like you'll get blessings in the future. And then thought number two was, well, you shouldn't have been an idiot and ate at Taco Bell five times during the last week. Okay, so that's where I want to jump in. I went through a phase after college where I my my magical worldview was falling apart and I desperately was trying to make the make the church true via um, it fits with natural laws in the world. Mm-hmm. And tithing was an issue that was a big deal for me because I just could not afford to pay it. And I started to to question how that could possibly work out. And I came to the conclusion that in order to pay your tithing, especially if you don't have a lot of money, you have to be very careful with your money, more careful than you would be if you weren't paying your tithing because you had a little bit more breathing room Mm -hmm. and the natural outcome of handling your money more carefully because you've got to spread it more thinly is that you have it to, to fill your tank with gas because you kept track of it so much more carefully because you didn't have that little bit of wiggle room to go buy the candy bar and maybe go out of control a little bit Mm -hmm. with your spending. So it seems to me like if you're going to be tracking your money very carefully in order to get by with paying your tithing, then the natural outcome is that you're going to squeak by. So when, so when people have an experience where I, I was worried that I wasn't going to make it through the month, but I had had faith and paid my tithing and, and I was able to cover my rent. Well, yeah, because you carefully tracked your money and sat down and stuck to your budget because you had to. Okay, can I simplify this a little bit more? Sure, go for it. If you made it through the month and you are consequently still a breathing sentient being, there is a narrative for you to rely on which says, and look, I made it. Yep. There is no disconfirming narrative if you're just willing to believe that as long as you're able to survive and get by, the Lord is blessing you because you paid your tithing. So the only alternative, the only way for you to believe <laughs> the only way or the, the, the only way for you to uh, 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 accept that the Lord didn't help you make it through that scrape is if you're face down dead in the gutter, in which case you are not here to give us your disconfirming narrative. Well, I just along those lines, Greg, I have I know someone that works in um, in a public assistance kind of in, in the housing market here in Salt Lake City. And I've heard her say many times in talking to families who are losing their houses um, that they would refuse to they would they would not stop paying their tithing at the expense of their mortgage. And mm-hmm. now she's trying to put them into low income housing. Yep. Like, right. I want to know how in the hell that could be explained as a blessing. And but how- the narrative says it's a trial. The well, narrative yeah. gives an escape hatch for that. Well, m- it my, says, "Oh well, this is the Lord trying you, and, and I'm not. This is the Lord blessing you, or I'm, you made it. You're still alive. He blessed you. You ha- you're taking breath." And I'm not trying to be a jerk, but but this is probably going to come off really jerkish. But 
to a believer, they would probably respond if they looked at that situation, they'd probably respond and say, well, you're not living within your means. You overextended yourself. You need to cut back somewhere. Yeah, Mormons, that's their second favorite pastime, and that's judging the spiritual situation of others based on their physical lot in life. Which, if we were to do... first favorite pastime. Well, if if we were to do (laughs) an honorable mention, I mean, that would be... That would be a great one to throw in there because I don't think we're doing that with this one. But, um, uh, Amy, what about you? What, what's uh, what's one of yours? I think I'm going to go with the belief, one, that Satan controls the water. Mm-hmm. And for me growing up, uh, and Greg, you and I had talked about this, I guess, last week, and you weren't so sure it was a belief till your wife said that she had heard it. So thanks for the way <laughs> in on that one. But that the Satan is able to control the waters um, at a higher degree on Sundays And, of course, I think all of us have heard that Satan controls the waters and that it's dangerous for missionaries to be in water. Now, the background for this fringe doctrine comes from the Doctrine and Covenants, Section 61, and it is relating to a trip that uh, Joseph Smith and a couple, actually about 10 elders, were traveling down the Missouri River in their canoes, and on the third day, W.W. Phelps had a what is what he called a daylight vision, and he saw a destroying a destroyer riding upon the face of the waters. And the section goes a little something like this: um, This is DNC. 6114, Behold, I, the Lord, in the beginning blessed the waters, but in the last days, by the mouth of my servant John, I curse the waters. Wherefore, the day will come that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters, and it shall be said in days to come that no one is able to go up to the land of Zion upon the waters, but that he is upright in heart. And it goes on. Now, growing up in California where it's really blasted hot during the summer, this was a major sacrament meeting doctrine, a major fringe doctrine that was discussed because lots of people had swimming pools. And when it's 115 degrees in the summer, um, even on a Sunday, you kind of want to get in the pool. And that was a big topic of contention for members that had pools. Who was allowed to go in the pool on Sundays? Who wasn't? Were you a... Uh, you know, kind of a less faithful family if you'd let your kids swim? Did you have a special prayer before you got in the water? And so on and so forth. So this was one that came to mind for me just because it was a part of my growing up. Um, Now, when we look at this doctrine and we look at the belief system that comes uh, through it, this revelation talks about these waters. Now, anyone could say, or we could say reasonably, that it was specifically the waters that they were floating their canoe down. He doesn't say all water, but this continues to be a really persistent belief. And I found some really interesting things and something that I had never heard of in the, in David O. McKay's, the rise of modern Mormonism, there was serious discussion in early 1967 that the church was going to start through the building committee to make temple ships so that ships could sail as temples to locations where people did not have access to do their, their temple work. And in this book, it stated that Elder Dyer stopped this conversation cold by reminding everyone, quote, raise the question as to the cursing that has been placed upon the waters in these last days as to whether it be proper in the light of the statement by the prophet to contra- construct a temple to sail on the waters. He also made a curious point that was completely at odd with the notion of building any new temples. Um, Why should we be so pressing and introducing such urgency methods to get temple work done for people in remote places, since most temple work will be accomplished in the millennium? (laughs) So it does have some doctrinal basis, and obviously some belief systems are still holding tight to this. Um, I was even taught that... um, no one should ever be baptized in open water because Satan controls the water so strongly. And in doing research for this topic, I came across on the Mormon Dialogue Message Board, and this message was written on August 26, 2011. And the poster goes on to talk about how he's going on a trip to California. Um, there's going to be a beach house there. And the mother told everyone that she strictly forbids anyone getting into the waters on Sunday and then goes into detail about um where, where is, is this really a belief? Is this really not a belief? Now, doctrinally, it has some history and it is a belief. 
but more so what I think the Sunday thing has to do with is people being perceived as um, not keeping the Sabbath day holy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and, and the idea that the people that allow themselves to do it rationalize, well, if I didn't get hurt, then I was blessed. But all in all, I mean, it's a really illogical application nowadays because people are in the water. I mean, before there were planes, missionaries had to sail to places. They were on these, quote unquote, these waters all the time, and there was never a problem with it. Um, And so I thought it was really interesting that we all at one time almost had temple ships in the LDS church. I don't know. Does anyone else have any experience in this? It it was a big deal in my growing up. Stay out of the water on Sundays. Missionaries can never be, can never go swimming. um, And that Satan controls the water, which is bizarre to me. I I know for for me, while I was on my mission, that was a a lot of, that was one of the topics that was discussed a lot because it's, you, you look through the, uh, you look through the missionary, the white missionary handbook, it says no swimming and then you you find that curious uh, section within the Doctrine and Covenants, and of course, missionaries are always looking to connect things together. That was the thing that was talked about. But I actually had a mission president that said, no, that's not the case. The reason why is because missionaries are supposed to look professional, and you really can't look professional if you're hanging out at a beach in your swimsuit, and you're not supposed to be out there playing while you're on your mission. You're supposed to be serving. So, But what about P-Day? Mm-hmm. Even P Day. I mean, we went to a beach, but we were not allowed to go in the water. Really? Yep. Because I know that you know nice. missions do have sanctions. You know, they're not going to let you on P Day go rock climbing because it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. There's some missions that don't allow you to play basketball. There's mm-hmm. some mission. You know, there's all kinds of different little, I don't know, checks and balances depending on your mission, depending on your mission president, uh, and depending on the time and culturally in which you're, which you're going on your mission. Um, but I mean, it, I can see it makes sense to keep people safe, but this whole idea that Satan controls the water is, I don't, I don't quite understand it. <laughs> I mean, there's a larger meta dialogue here. This, this is very similar to the idea that, that the Holy ghost goes to bed at midnight. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you wonder to what degree these are, these are narratives that are spun out of a desire to control people's behavior, and you, you know, baby Jesus cries when you pulls the kid when you pull the kitty's tail. So um, it just comes out of the same narrative. It comes out of this hyper sense that the world is scary, that the world is out of control, that there are forces that are going to just overcome you at any moment, and you know, it's just kind of. It's just kind of part and parcel with Mormonism in general. I would agree with that. Oh, I mean, you act as if I'm not. You act as if that's a foreign concept, Brand. No, but I, I'm just. Say. <sighs> Listen, <laughs> my tolerance only no, goes so far. I mean, I in going along with the idea of keeping the Sabbath day holy. I mean, if you're, if you aren't a, abiding by the rules of the game, then obviously Satan's already got his claws on you a little bit anyway. And the further you, you go into the deep end, devil's going to get you. Angel you know, I say, on a daily basis, the influence of Satan is given more, um, is given more credence in Mormonism than the influence of God. Satan is the one to be concerned about. Satan's going to come and get you at any moment. God, God can be. He's he's off building worlds somewhere. He's not going to come to your help. Satan is going to get you. That's the real wait, wait, wait. Quotidian wait. influence that's pumped in Mormonism. God is too busy helping you find your keys. Don't forget. Whoa, Sorry. not a joke I expected from you. I, I know. <laughs> While Satan drowns your children on Sunday, <laughs> God is off looking for someone's Toyota Sienna keys. That, no, that's, it's, that's it's eighty. So they can get to Elder's Quorum on time. It's it's eighty year old Sister Smith, so she can get to the temple. Not uh, anyways. I should probably ah, stop. Sister Smith and have her work done in the millennium. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see who's next. Heather, were you next? This one I took control of because I have I have a niece with Down syndrome, and that is the idea that the disabled. Are were one either extremely righteous in the preexistence, or two escorted Lucifer out of heaven, 
and therefore when they came to this earth they had to be protected. I first became aware of this idea when I was in high school. A friend of mine and and I I remember very clearly we were in biology class and for some reason she just brought it up out of the blue that down people with down syndrome were the ones who physically escorted Satan out of heaven and he has it out for them and so God knew that he had to protect those people and therefore he gave them down syndrome to make them less uh, susceptible to the slings of Satan and so basically the only reason they're coming here to this earth is to get a body they've Mm -hmm. already their metals already been tested and um, I did a lot of looking around online to try to find a source for this. And this may be one that is truly a Mormon urban legend because the the one source I can find is this idea that a Down syndrome boy was allowed to have a, a patriarchal blessing. And in the patriarchal blessing, the guy says all this stuff, the, the patriarch says all this stuff about him. And then at the end of the patriarchal blessing for a short period of time, he is not handicapped and he is able to speak to his parents as a fully functioning teenager. And then the other um, example I, I was able to find was of a boy who was severely handicapped, not with Down syndrome, with something else. He was severely physically and mentally handicapped, receiving a, a patriarchal blessing in which the patriarch expounds upon how he was a valiant missionary and soldier in the preexistence and had proved to God before coming here that he deserved the celestial kingdom. And therefore his only goal in coming here was to get a body. And then he, when he died, he would go straight to the celestial kingdom. I personally think that this idea came about to solve the question of if we come here to be tested, then why would God send people here who can't, who don't have the mental faculties to interact with the world in a way that they will be tested. And it also, I think, makes people feel better because when you have a child with a handicap, there is, because of the way the world reacts to your child and, and treats your child, there is a um, there is a tender spot as to the, the worth of your child. And, it, and so this doctrine kind of provides that comfort for people. Let me, let me ask you a question because I, I, I understand, well, all right, I'll just ask it, but but know that I'm asking okay. out of a out of a duty of a host, not because I'm an insensitive prick. Okay. Okay. But why? It seems like this is a doctrine that's really empowering to those who might have uh, mental difficulties or mental handicaps. And you said the it was something that was a little sensitive to you. Why would it be sensitive to you if it was something that was empowering to to those who were suffering from it? Um, Because, one, I think that it put a lot of pressure on my sister. When Madeline was born, my sister said to my mother with great fear, she's a very choice spirit, and I don't know. I don't know if I'm worthy of her. Mm. And I think Mm. it put a great deal of pressure on her. And two, the other reason is that before I lost my faith, Madeline is the most awesome person I've ever met on this planet. She is my favorite human being, but I didn't fully accept her as being who she is because I saw Down syndrome as a veil that was over her that one day would be removed so that I would really get to know her. Mm. And I don't think that those two things are particularly helpful. I want to talk about that concept really quick. Go because ahead. so one of our uh, so one of our kids, our son, is mildly autistic, and um, and when we found that out, we didn't know that it was going to be mild because he just had sort of typical typical um, symptoms. He stopped talking, and he wasn't you know his social abilities from a very early age were were clearly <laughs> sort of um, behind the curve uh, a lot. And so, you know, we had this silent 18-month-old just just all of a sudden stop talking. Autism is a little different than having Down syndrome because it's such a wide range. You know, you could have autistics who are highly, highly successful, very, you know, end up being, find their place in the world. You know, they become mechanical engineers and stuff. But uh, what I had to grapple with and... You know, one of those proverbial seeds of my loss of faith was this concept, just like you say, Heather, of is this him or Mm -hmm. is him a different person? Do I like do I accept him and who he is now? And do I accept the person that he is and his value as a person 
what he has to contribute, his talents, his quirks, his weirdness? Or do I think, oh, that'll all be fixed? And if I think that'll be fixed, what does it mean for me to say that I think he's broken and, and who else is broken that needs to be fixed in that way? And I think because, especially as he got a little older and we saw that it was going to be mild, uh, maybe, you know, that it was going to be less of a thing in his life, that gets really complicated in terms of trying to figure out what the concept of the resurrection is going to be for him. Will he still be the person that we know him to be? And, you know, that that just all started to fall apart. Well, I, I've got a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I know for me personally, I have a, um, in my entire family, my direct family is the only members, uh, my aunts and uncles aren't. Uh, but I have a cousin who is, um, I think she's about 43 or 44 years old, and she has Down syndrome, which uh, apparently from what I've heard is uh, a very long lifespan for someone who suffers from Down syndrome. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of think the same way that, that you do, Greg, simply in the fact of I love her personality. She is one of the most pure-hearted people I know, and, and I think, Heather, you touched on this too, but I couldn't imagine her any other way. And I think that... Mormons want to, in a sense, they want to use uh, this whole concept that someone who is mentally handicapped, it's an empowering thing to not only reassure the individual, but to also reassure the parents that you did nothing wrong. I think we still hold some of those those old-time uh, um, concepts that if your child was born with some sort of malfunction or some sort of disability or, or handicap, I'm probably being very culturally insensitive, but... Um, that if they're born with something like that, then it was something wrong with the parents. In a religious context, they they weren't worthy. Or if it's in a, you know, in, in any context, that they did something wrong that they could have done better, and it's a it's a reassurance thing. But on the same hand, I can also see it being uh, a, a little bit condescending, especially for for those who've learned to to love their children with their um, I'll call it um, unique personality quirks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I agree. All right, let's um, let's go through uh, and uh, one more each from everyone, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Greg, what do you got? Well, let's talk about just let's consolidate a couple of things just in terms of the temple. Um, one, I was taught that the temple ceremonies were ancient. So my dad, when I was getting ready to go through the endowment, he said, "Now this is uh, this is really different than the rest of church." And uh, it's really symbolic. It's it's really old, and it's got all of this sort of. It's it's just really different than sort of everything else in Mormonism. And he said, and the reason for that is, is because these ceremonies are really really old, and they they date back to essentially ancient times, and um, they and they uh, come up through sort of King Solomon's temple and everything, and. And any connection then to masonry in the temple ceremony was just, well, the masons get it from King Solomon's temple, and we get it from King Solomon's temple and from these ancient ceremonies. And that kind of was is the uh, is the sort of normal everyday, uh, maybe just slightly below the surface understanding of where the connection is to masonry and ancient ceremonies in the temple and everything. And of course, historically, that's completely false. Um, the Masons just made it all up and we just cribbed from the Masons. Um, then the other thing that is, I think, a really, really common belief, and that I, I think Mormons take this very seriously, is that Jesus, the person of Jesus, his body, goes and walks through all the temples. Like if you were in the temples at night or something, Jesus would be just strolling through in a very, in a very dignified celestial way, but be strolling through the temple that he goes and hangs out there, that they – you know, we say they are literally the house of God on earth. I was trying to find out who said that. Someone I said something Kimble like that. Or Benson or something. What? I was going to say someone said something along those lines. Yeah, I was. I, I don't. I have no. I, and I was trying to ask around some of the groups today, and I asked Mike Tannehill, and he couldn't remember, but he said, "Yeah, I've totally heard that." Um, that Jesus has visited all the temples, you know, and that there's all these stories. There's all these apocryphal stories of. Of going to the temple and or and talking to people who are like, oh, you know, Jesus was there. I think there's a story. I want to say it's President Kimball comes out of the room in the temple and they're like, 
President Kimball, do you want to turn off the light? And he says, no, that light, he can turn out him, you know, he can mm-hmm. turn out the light himself or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and so, we, have you not heard that? I've heard that one. Totally, right? So, um, so we, I mean, we take this seriously. We take it really seriously until you get a little bit disenchanted. You take it really seriously that on Thursdays, Jesus is in the center chair, you know, and um, t- that there that that's the whole that that's the thing. That's the thing about being a Mormon is we got the we've got the the, the hotline to the hotline to Jesus. The bat phone. I mean, you know, I wasn't going to go there. Well, I I'm it's cool that you did. I was going to say I'm the believer, so I can I can tell you what we can go to and what we can't go to. Yeah. So what? So what do you think <laughs> about that, Grant? How how do you regard this concept? Of, Jesus' person walking through the temples on any given Tuesday. Uh, oh. See, I, or do you, I, I cringe. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm actually just – because I won't argue with you. Like, here, tell you what. I'll call a truce. Yeah. I won't respond. I'll take my answer off the, line, off the, off the air. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I think right now. I, 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 I cringe when these questions are asked because half of me is – Greg, I'm trying to use your coaching and use your, your coaching when it comes to logic and evidence and things like that. And half of me sits here and says, that doesn't make sense at all. That that's weird. That doesn't fall in with things. But then on the other hand, I'm I'm called back to to my traditional upbringing, and the traditional upbringing is we call this the house of the Lord for a certain reason, and it was one of those kind of like some of these other doctrines. It's one of those things where it was always hush hush, wink wink, nudge nudge. It's the house of the Lord, so it's His house, and He can go in there whenever He wants, and you never know. That's the reason why we leave the lights on because Jesus might want to take a walk through the temple. And it's it's tough for me because I sit there and, and I try and um, – uh, it's not that I try and rationalize it in my brain, but I, I try and weigh both of these things. And I sit here and say, yeah, he, I could say that he walks through the temple and he goes and visits his house. But at the same time, does that make me sound like a crazy person? And that's a rhetorical, that's a rhetorical question. You don't need to answer that one. Oh, sorry. You can edit that out. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me, Amy, am I crazy? I don't think you're crazy. I mean, I think it's one of those feel-good doctrines. People want to believe it because it makes them feel good. There's really no purpose in believing it. You know, like what is accomplished by believing that Jesus walks through the temple? Because my first question is, why leave the light on? He's Jesus. Can he see in the dark? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's just one of those things. Where it it makes people feel good to think that they walk in the footsteps of where Jesus walks Mm -hmm. and that they're doing the things that Jesus did. I I don't, I mean, like, it just doesn't, I don't see how it accomplished, except to make you feel good. I don't see what else it accomplishes having that belief. I think it reinforces uh, the exclusivity claims of the church. Oh, totally. One of the interesting stories that I heard about designing the San Diego Temple, which was our temple that got built when I was a kid and, and the one that was close to us was this idea of the grand like sweeping circular staircase and and that uh, somebody said to the architect or you know i i don't remember all this because it was like seminary story but you know you know the lord has preferences too and and he likes spiral staircases <laughs> and he likes the color gold he loves that you know? antebellum decor <laughs> yeah i know like like this is we decorate it this way because this is what God likes, you know. He's oh, he's into God. circular staircases, and and they were this this was not winking. No, this, this was, was dead serious. Dead serious. Yep. That was like a that was like a spiritual moment. I'm having a spiritual moment right now thinking about it. It's like a derivative spiritual moment. Anyway, <laughs> on we go. Man, Mormons are weird. Um, <laughs> uh, Amy, I think I will choose the belief Brigham Young morphed into Joseph Smith while giving a talk about who should take over the leadership of the Mormon church after Joseph and Hiram Smith were murdered in the Carthage jail. So this belief goes back to the talk that was given on August 8th, 1844. And it was kind of a, I wouldn't say a debate, but kind of a a stump speech, if you will, between Sidney Rigdon, who had traveled back from, I don't know, like Vermont or something, um, to have this conversation with the members of the church and Brigham Young. And the members who were there to witness this talk, this is from LDS.org, this portion that I'm 
taking the information from. The members say they witnessed a miracle, that it looked as though Brigham Young had literally transformed into Joseph Smith before their very eyes. He looked like Joseph Smith, he sounded like Joseph Smith, his mannerisms were like Joseph Smith, and the, the people that saw this vision believed that this was in response to who should be the next prophet. Zena Huntington, one of the prophet's wives, uh, Prophet Joseph's wife, said that President Young was speaking. It was the voice of Joseph Smith, not that of Brigham Young. His very person changed, and I closed my eyes. I could have exclaimed, I know that is Joseph's voice, but yet I knew he was gone. George Q. Cannon, in the book Church History of the Fullness of Times, stated it was the voice of Joseph Smith himself. It seemed in the eyes of the people as though it was the very person which stood before them. Um, If I had not seen it with my very own eyes, it could could convince me that it was not him. Um, Two other quotes or two other people who said that they saw this were Cornelius and Permelia Lott, who ran the Joseph Smith farm right outside Nauvoo. And they attended the meeting with their children. And when Broom Young got up to speak, it is said that the 11-year-old Alzinia Lott said, she turned to her mother and said, Mama, I thought the prophet was dead. And her mother said, he is Alzinia, and this is the way our Heavenly Father has told us who shall be our next prophet and leader. And that's quoted from the descendants of Cornelius Peter Lott. In doing some research about this, and I heard this growing up, my father is a, uh, you know, gets really still when he tells the story kind of his own little version of bearing his testimony. I know a lot of members take this really, really seriously and as a literal event. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, the main problem with this is that no one talked about this amazing transformation when it happened. There are no journals, letters, or newspaper accounts written at the time. There was a person that took minutes. No transformation occurred or was mentioned at that time. Historian Richard Van Wagner has searched all the diaries and journals and newspapers and church records that were written shortly after the meeting and has found no evidence to suggest that there was a miraculous transformation. Brigham Young's speech was reported in detail in both of the Nauvoo News newspapers recorded by scribes for the church official records. There were hundreds present when he spoke, and there was not one mention of anything miraculous or divine. Currently, many believing members will say, well, if you didn't see it, it's because you aren't in touch with the Spirit. Those of us who saw it are in touch with the Spirit, and that's why we know it to be true. This account, this story, was not written until 13 years after the speech was given. And I found one kind of interesting quote And that was from Bishop George Miller, who was present at the gathering and later recalled that nothing supernatural had occurred on that day and that Brigham Young had made a long, loud harangue. Miller later wrote, for which I could see no point in the course of his remarks other than to overturn Signe Rigdon's pretensions. So even the bishop back then didn't have his spiritual vision. So I think, I mean, this is one of those things you can't really say is, is debunkable or true because it includes the concept of a vision and believers are more apt to accept the idea of a vision, especially when it comes to Joseph Smith and the Holy Spirit. But historical records and accounts kind of point to this not having had happened, especially since it wasn't even talked about until almost 15 years later. And I would well, that- also I would also highly recommend read Harper's uh, article in the Fall 96 Journal of Mormon History. That one's really, really good. Get to know. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say if Brent had anything to add to that or if he had heard anything, you go ahead. Um, no, I, I don't. I, I think you did a great job covering it. I know that for me personally, that was really talked about as an actual event. I mean, every lesson that I ever had growing up, that was treated as an actual event. And I think that... Um, not until um, Andy Ehat wrote a, a doctrinal thesis or a master's uh, thesis on uh, the succession crisis of uh, the time, and that was one of the few things that started us really examining the transformation and, and looking at it a little bit deeper. Uh, and Reed Harper did a great job of covering all the things that you talked about and basically you know, saying, we really don't, I, I don't think it happened. And it's something that we take as fact and, and that we kind of use to say, well, see, uh, you know, Joseph gave his blessing and or like the mom told her little girl, that's how we know that Heavenly Father has chosen Brigham Young. And that's what we accept within Mormonism. You know, and there's an interesting thing that goes, there's this 
this tale that we hear about the 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 accounts, the uh, the later accounts and the and the contemporary accounts is interesting. But modern neuroscience adds an interesting twist in that we have this notion of memory. In fact, we have a doctrinal notion of the importance of memory. Cast your mind back on what you remembered. And we certainly have a perception that memory is uh, permanent and that, you know, and that our memories are true. But modern neuroscience says memory is malleable. And in fact, it's imperceptibly malleable. And every time we access a memory from our brain. We access it, recreate it, end up changing it a little bit and put it back and don't ever know it so that the only memories that are strictly the way that you, the strictly the way that they're recorded are the ones that are never, the ones that are never accessed. Um, you can, it's fascinating stuff from uh, Joan Allaire in um, Proust, was a neurosci- Proust was a neuroscientist about the way our memories change over time. We're completely unaware of it. I believe some of the accounts, the later accounts of people who just absolutely swore up and down that they saw this were proved that they couldn't have been there. And yet they had a memory of the event. It had been it had been put in, you know, it had been crafted in and they sort of created a memory out of whole cloth. There's so many interesting things mm. about the way that memory is completely is, is uh, not completely, but the way that memory ends up being unreliable absolutely fascinating stuff. Heather, it sounded like you had a thought. Well, I was, I'm just curious what was going on 13, 15 years later or whenever these accounts started to come up that were, that were prompting people to invent this memory. Um, Do we know? I, the only thing that could be Didn't, seen as different is the saints had just settled in Utah and maybe there was some maybe second guessing or hesitation or worry or wonder if this was the right thing we should have done and maybe that's why people started talking about this or asserting that this happened to kind of solidify and justify their choices and to kind of shut up the naysayers that that's about all i can and now that you say that i remember doing the top 10 apostles that were excommunicated episode on mormon expression Mm -hmm. and um there was a lot of fighting still going on between the different breakoff sects when Brigham Young came out to Utah. And perhaps it was to solidify that the other groups were the wrong groups and Brigham, the Brighamite church was the right group. Right. Yeah, Brent, do you know the story on this? Because I guess I was under the impression in a similar way that it was, you know, like um, Joseph the Third and people from people that became RLDS showed up in in Salt Lake, but I I will say I I don't know that authoritatively. I'm I'm really not well versed in it, but um, what I what I can say is this: it's really fascinating. Once you look at once they're established in Utah, then you really start getting these I won't say crazy folk doctrines, but you get a lot of the expansive mindset of Mormonism coming up once they get established and settled in Utah. It was almost as if they said, okay, we're in Utah now. We don't need to worry about anyone else making fun of us or talking about our our religious practices in the newspaper. We can do what we want. And that might have been one of those things where if if the RLDS story was true or if, if there were starting to become breakoff sects where people were, I guess, second-guessing things, that that seems to me to be a perfect feeding ground for people to start not not outright lying, but someone saying, well, yeah, you know, Brigham really sounded like Joseph. And, oh, well, yeah, I, I, I kind of remember he even looked like him a little bit. And then it just the, it just kind of spreads like wildfire. Transfiguration telephone. Mm-hmm. Was that all? Do we hit all of them? I have one more that I wanted to throw in at the that wasn't originally on the list, but I think would be fun to wrap up with. Throw it in there. The Telestial Smoothies. What's that? Uh, you'll have to. I, I've never heard of that. <laughs> This is something yes, that came have. up in the, in the Mormon Expression VIP lounge recently. Um, it's the idea that we will all have Barbie Ken doll oh, genitalia right. if oh, we're yeah. in the lower kingdoms um, in heaven. And this originated with um, <laughs> Joseph Fielding Smith. In and it's and it's documented in the Doctrines of Salvation, Volume Two, pages two eighty seven and two eighty eight. Mm. And basically, he's talking about how in the lower kingdoms, the terrestrial and celestial, there will be um, no marriages. People will live singly. They will not have the power of procreation. And very specifically, it says, "I take it that men and women will, in these kingdoms, be just what the so-called Christian world expects us 
to be, neither man nor woman, merely immortal beings having received the resurrection. Not the perfected resurrection, because you can't go sticking your naughty bits in other people if you are not going to be exactly. celestially procreating. Exactly. They're not oh, naughty I, bits. Uh, all right. You're procreating, Greg. I, I, will, I will tell you this. I have only heard this one once. Um, I was in the MTC and uh, the person, I, I guess they kind of segregated us out by um, geographic area. So we were in the same wing as uh, some of the Japanese speakers, the Korean speakers. And we also had a couple Laotians who were going to be going to Laosha. I don't remember. Laos. Laos. Thank Laos. you. There you go. It was, there was only two missionaries that were going to be going to Laos and they were going to be speaking Laotian. And I guess they had a head of that geographic area who was Laotian who taught that class. And he would come around once a week and we would talk to him and he would want to know what's going on. And he was one of those guys that was basically, you ask me any question, you ask me any gospel question and I can prove it to you by the scriptures. So one day we were just sitting around talking and I don't know how it happened. And he basically said, all right. You want to know the difference between us and people in the Telestial Kingdom? And I said, uh, okay, sure. And he goes through and, and finds five or six scriptures that links this whole concept together. And, of course, as as 19-year-old boys who have been denied um, girls for a while, we're sitting here, our mind is just blown, sitting here going, oh, okay, we got to be really good so we can you know, get to the Celestial <laughs> Kingdom and, and we'll have that stuff. But I am not kidding you when I say that is the only time i've ever heard that in my life i didn't hear that i didn't hear it in terms of the ken doll thing but i told i heard that so many times i think i think this is a this is a delightful point to sort of hammer in joseph fielding smith at who is the grandson of hiram and becomes the prophet of the church he presents as as a leading authority of the church he presents a view of god that sort of gives God the sophistication, the biological sophistication of a 13-year-old in that God would resurrect you in this way and that they are naughty bits if they have to be taken away so that you can't play with them in the celestial kingdom. Like, and it, the, the, the lack of sophistication of that worldview is staggering. Now, listen, listen. To think that that's a prophet of God is just... I. Yeah, you are bitter tonight. Listen, I know what he's thinking. He's worried that if all of... Oh, this is going to be taken so out of context. He's worried that if all of you go to the Telestial Kingdom and have those naughty bits, you guys are going to sit around like a dog just licking yourself the entire time. <laughs> no, I'll li not, no, licking each other. Oh, like. licking each other. Oh, okay. Not, don't, there's no need to we're we live in concert with one another in the celestial kingdom in the terrestrial kingdom it, it'll 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 be fun well i'm, I'm just looking for it i'm just saying i mean he, he was probably looking out for you guys let's i let's, see let's move on i think that it with that shit i think that it shows go ahead it shows on the part of um joseph fielding smith trying to solve a problem just like i said earlier with my mom and the sleeper sleeper satan people how how if if the celestial kingdom is the only place that procreation is going to occur then how do we stop the people in the lower kingdoms from having internal increase well their bits can't work well that's easy for a guy we'll just make it not you know inflate but <laughs> women don't have to inflate to 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 make use of them of their of their bits oh. so Yes, we have to get do. rid of them. Do we wanna... Why not just remove desire? Why not remove a carnal desire from your heart? Why remove your genitalia? That seems or contrary how... to the plan of creating a perfect human body. Or how about this? In, in how, the about, resurrect how about we how just about stop telling we... people to stop using their body? I propose that we remove the ovums and sperms so that people will be able to have something to make eternity tolerable and then there won't be still won't be babies everybody gets oh, a yeah. it's a celestial kingdom vasectomy well, hold on we all know that would actually be the only tenable doctrine of the resurrection you could not say that the kendall version would be functioning because the scriptures say that you'll have a perfect Celestial, so like a perfectly, you know, functioning, perfect body. And so since we're not good enough to procreate, we just get to do the fun part and leave all the Mormons to have the brats in eternity. It's fantastic. I love this concept. <laughs>
Grant, have you can totally have a billion derailed? kids, baby. <sighs> totally happy for you to do that. Listen, I'm going to spend all eternity just singing praises to God and, yeah. Not having yeah. carnal thoughts. <laughs> I, you know, I think we should probably end this. <laughs> should we wrap this up? You guys are making me tired. We should wrap this up. Um, just as a uh, as a quick aside, before we before we wrap this up, a couple of ones we didn't get to. Um, face cards are satanic. That was one of yours, Amy. Uh, if you're under age eight, you're going straight to the celestial kingdom. Um, if you die, that's straight up doctrine. So that's not even. Well, some people take it to an extreme, though. I mean, it, well, we don't have time, but but. We can do a part two to this. Yeah, if we, if uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I won't. Greg, you don't <laughs> have to be here. Oh, okay, that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, what else? Uh, John the Beloved and the Three Nephites. All the wonderful, wonderful stories about that. Uh, we'll never go to the moon because there are Quakers there. And or Jesus drank grape juice. Jesus great drank grape juice. That one's very prominent. Uh, one of my pers- I was so pleased to hear my daughter's primary teacher telling her that as I stood in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> that that filled my heart with love. Um, one of my personal favorite ones, and this was actually a quote from Joseph Smith. I don't have it offhand, but um, basically the city of uh, Enoch that was translated because they were so righteous, they actually came up out of the Gulf of Mexico. That's why there's the Gulf of Mexico there is because a landmass was taken out of there and taken up to heaven. Uh, I've but, heard that one. But I, I think that, you know, Listen, uh, for for those of you who are a little bit disaffected from the church, I'm sure you could sit back and laugh at all these things and sit here and say, oh, this is these stupid Mormons and the stupid things they believe. And gosh, we were so gullible back then. And and even for, for people like me who are a believer, I kind of sit here and, you know, when you write everything out in a one sentence thing, it's a little hokey. But this is, you know, I'm going to echo John Larson a little bit. And I never thought I would echo John Larson, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to echo him in this sense. This is part of our culture. And I understand that now with a, with a media spotlight on us and with people looking more closely at us with, with Mitt Romney being who he is and everything, I understand some of this stuff is a little bit hokey. But the problem is we get so gosh darn sensitive about it. If anyone pokes a little bit of fun at it or if anyone even just not maliciously but just out of joking says, really? I mean, come on. I think we need to own a little bit of this. And number one, I think we need to stomp out a lot of these rumors as, as much as I love them. But on the other hand, I think we need to to own it a little bit and, and say, yeah, that, that was part of our history. And that was who we were. And, you know, that's I'm not saying we believe all that stuff. But, yeah, it's it's been talked about. For what Amen, it's worth, Brant, I don't think that the people I don't think, oh, those are stupid Mormons and stupid Mormon beliefs. I think this is the stuff that makes Mormonism fun. I agree with that, Heather. Greg, I don't think it's what makes people stupid. I just think it's what makes people human. I don't know if I think it's what makes people what makes Mormonism fun. I just it's just part of being human is believing wacky things. Uh, well, we want to thank you. We want to send a huge thank you out to uh, the Whitefields Educational Foundation for their generous donation in helping us get the podcast up off the ground. This is a production of the Whitefields Educational Foundation. Uh, we recommend all of you go visit it and uh, see the different projects that Whitefield has out there. There's a lot of amazing things going on. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys for being on the panel. Thank you, Greg, Amy, Heather. You're welcome. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you, sir. Uh, you guys were, were nice to me, and that's that's always appreciated. And uh, we would invite everyone to go visit our website, www.mormonexpositor.com. If you have some fringe folk beliefs that you remember, throw them up there. We'll have some fun with them. And we'll talk to you again after a while. That was so super fun. Yay. That was fun. This episode was directed and hosted by Brant, produced by Heather and Amy, and the theme music was provided by Matt Crowley. Thank you for listening. 
The Mormon Expositor Podcast is a production of the Whitefields Educational Foundation, a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. Find us on the web at whitefieldseducational.org. The Mormon Expositor, Mormon Expression Voices, Feminist Mormon Housewives, and Pesquisas Mormonas Podcasts, as well as other educational initiatives, such as the Mormon Archive and Mormon Audio Library, are made possible by your generous donations. Please consider a subscription today.